does everyone understand the assignment? Um, so when we're calculating the sizes, of this, do yeah. you want that in like a paper, like a like a document? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We don't have to show you the code that actually types it. Because there's like I'm getting code to get the size of this. I'm doing some math. Like a table and show like yeah, you need to show how you got all the calculation. Okay. Otherwise, you know, if the answer is five or twenty-five, is like, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the report is you know, code that actually calculates. It might be good to turn that into. If I don't believe this, then I have something to fall back on. Look at right. I'm just saying, like, once I've calculated the character takes so much space, you know, necessarily right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Can you see, ask the question again? Of, So when you say create a new document, what do you mean by that? Uh, just uh, print, printing the I mean, there's no user interface with it. We're not expected to actually write the character with a certain font. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, you're not. You're not. This is just about creating classes, creating te unit tests. Yeah, the, the basic question is, you know, how much space they're going to save, right? And so the question is, how much space is it really taking in both cases? So I, Let's, yeah, but I mean, I think some of the confusion you're looking at the, the wiki for there's something that they can use the document words and font. The user interface. No, I mean, it'd be nice if you could do that, right? I mean, it's a good exercise, but. We're at the end of the semester. And time does get short. The purpose of this is to make the classes. Make the classes and then yes. so you can compute the size of the Do not create any word processor. So there's some basic questions like how you know how does the flyweight pattern work, right? If we don't understand how the flyweight pattern works, then we're not going to be able to calculate the size of using a flyweight pattern versus right, not using a flyweight pattern. Well, there might be more questions on Thursday, I guess.
Well, it doesn't matter too much because the question is how much space will it take, right? Right. The algorithm can be tricky, but how much space does it take? Yeah, right. No, I'm looking for how much space it'll take. I'll walk over there again and see if any questions pop up. All right, keyboard. So let's see, it's been a week, right? So. Yeah, we're looking at the last patterns and these active object, right? And like too many slides to go through, but we can come back to the side, log the meter. And remember we're like, okay, um You know, we're looking at the various patterns, the property pattern. Um, and this was, um, you know, part of was, you know, how do we, how do we deal with business rules, right? That change frequently. So how do we write software where people can some manager, some store can say, right, next week we're going to have, you know, buy two, get the third one free. If you buy more than $50 worth of stuff, right? And all of a sudden we need these cash registers to be able to handle that. Or how do we you know, let insurance people, you know, and that, you know, when they're interviewing customers to make all these modifications to all these policies and then say, here's what it's going to, here's what it's going to cost you. Right? How do you write software that's that flexible? Yeah. And so we went through all kinds of, Solutions, um, and I believe we stopped here to smart variable. Um, So years ago, I worked with some people on campus um, and they did ecological modeling. And so they'd create these computer models of various aspects of ecology. Um, you, know, you know, for example, like, okay, you want, you got soil and you get moisture and then you understand, you know, what the moisture content is, where it is, where it flows and, you know, the rain comes in and it percolates down, but then the rain goes away and the sun comes out and it dries the top and it starts, you know, sucking it back up again. And then, the, but then it's on a slow right? Um, and then of course it, it drains slowly this way and the top dries out faster. And then you're trying to figure out, okay, what's gonna grow there? What, what's the effect of all these climate changes gonna be and all this stuff. And so you got all these equations and 
you divide the cell, you know, by just, you, know, you, you divide the ground, little grids, right? And then you have all the equations, you run the equations of the grid, and then they get the interface. And then you know, the problem was, you know, you, you could run the model, but then you want to, what do you want to observe, right? And so you always had to like, oh, I want to, I want to look at this. Um, and then you have to modify the code. I'll put those parameters every so often so you could see how they changed. And it was like, what you want to be able to say, just pick all these variables. Okay, that variable punch yourself out. At, you know, just pick the ones, have somebody able to point to a, a variable and say, that one gets printed out, right? Print this out, print this out. Um, It's also the same thing when debugging, right? I mean, at some point you'd like to say, there's something going wrong, and then just show me the current state of these three variables as I step through the programming so I can see it, right? Ming, 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 ming. Um, and how do you do that, right? So the idea you know, of a smart variable is that it's smart enough to, so it knows when it changes. You can you can have hooks in it. Say, okay, now you know log the changes or trigger this other change um, just by assigning the variables a new new value. Rather than having to have this logic, we say, okay, you know, if. It, just no, I just want to know when it changed. Tell me when it changed. Um, so there are times when that's it's just useful. Um, right? And there's all kinds of places where when that something changes, we, we want to be notified. Um, like in a spreadsheet, right? It's like, oh, you know, when that cell changes value, it needs to broadcast a change out, right? Um, you know, another example is if we're storing this data on database and the variable changes, right, we need to update the database. Um, and so usually if you build all this logic in saying, okay, you know, I'm going to change this value to new value, and now what I have to do is, you know, generate this SQL query. It'd be nice to say, look, okay, whenever this thing changes, I don't care where it changes, just send it to the database. So I'd have to say, oh, every time I go there, do it. Um, right, so there's all these places where it's nice to be notified when something changes, and it's just not, And, you know, some languages are now providing this functionality. Um, so in Swift, they have what they call property observers. Um, and so on that first line, what we're saying is, okay, we're going to make um, you know, degrees Fahrenheit. Um, right. So it's a property, and it was set to zero. But when it's being changed, right, then um, there's a function built in that is called when it's going to change. And um, when it's going to change, and when it after the change, and you can actually um, override that change. Say, okay, I'm sorry, but this is San Diego, and we don't want those zero temperatures ever, right? So like, right? and we're done.
now we've got hooks where we can place in. When this changes, just do something. The validation happens after. Looks like you have validation at the inside. Um, they do it in the did set. Um, the world set doesn't have the ability to change, to modify it, but it can trigger other actions. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, you got pre and post operations you can perform on it, right? And so you call it pre operation, you do the operation, you call it post operation. And so if you want to, in the pre operation, you say it changes the old value, well, then the next step is to actually do the operation. You know, so it saves you the problem having to make it make the field private and then have a getter and setter and then um, and the setter doing the check is okay. We can now access that as a public field. Um, so we can access it when we want to, but now we can capture one of changes and do some operation. Not an earth shattering pattern, but it's can become useful. Um, So actually, there's um, Dr. Roach is working on one of her projects, um, <clears throat> the database of um, all this data they collect out in the ocean. So they they spend like a hundred million dollars. They get these big huge ships and they send them off to sea and they put all these sonar and microphones all over the ocean. And they're listening to various, look, listening for whales and you know, all, these, all these different um, mammals and making all these sounds. And those those microphones are out there for months, right? And they come and collect back in the of sound. Um, and then, you know, the next year they go to another project and they have this huge database. I mean, it's like, you walk in, this, you got this room of hard drives, and it's like, it's just rows and rows of hard drive and it's stacked up high. Um, the problem is, how does anyone ever find information about what they did, right? Three years ago. Um, because of the data is something that's enormous. There's this database, um, and the database is XML format to store, store data about the data. Um, and they have all this, Different people define different structures, and there's arguments of how they should taxonomy should go, and how they should organize the data. And so they have, there's a schema, right? Um, that specifies how the data goes into the database, how you get it back out again. But they know in the near future, there's going to be a standards committee that's going to change the schema. 
And the other part of the project is, you know, currently, how do you get the data in and out? Well, you write a little program to, you know, put the data in, a little program to get it out. And, but these are biologists and, and the oceanographers, and they like they don't know how to program. And so there's a grant to have a, basically a GUI interface to the database um, that allows you to then, you know, do queries and show show where the data is and show the location of all the stuff. But the problem is, you know, in the near future, the data the data structure is going to change, and so you don't want that application to actually have a hard code saying here is the current structure of the data because it's going to change in the future, right? So the whole application is basically has to read in a schema so it can show the, show the user here is this, here is the structure of the data, and if you want this little piece over here, here's how you query it. It all has to be generated from the schema. Because as soon as the schema changes, that's going to change, and the query is going to change because now it's a different location and it's tied together differently. And so it's all tied to XML schema that you have to read in before you do anything. It's a lot more work. It would have been easier just to hard code in, I mean, find the 15 most popular, right? Uh, queries and you just hard code that in. It would take you a couple of days, right? Now we're done, but the problem is next week or next month, going to change the schema, all those break, and go change them again. Um, And so you take the schema, and now we want to read the schema in and then generate code to do things based upon the schema. Right. Yeah, then it, you can change the schema, you change the database, and you're, you're fine. Code is looking at the schema. So right, right. Stuff. You don't need to generate code or There's a lot more work. And of course, at one point it was like, oh, we thought we had it working, but when you change the schema, the code that read the schema broke. Right, so yeah, you have to be able to, you know, read that scheme and be able to, you know, you know do operations. Um. Has anyone used Hibernate or Spring? Right, so that's an example where you you define right the mapping, right? And then Hibernate generates the code to actually take this object and put it into the database and in the reverse. Um, Actually, the GUI builders, are, it's really interesting now, and I have no idea why it's happened at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so for a long time, what you did is, like an Android or iOS, you build an application or a GUI application, and most, you know, for the last 20 years, any application that used a, a GUI, the GUI builder, right? And you would drag and drop the widgets, and there'd be some way of laying them out and getting a nice format and setting all the color properties and other text and fonts and all that sort of stuff. And then there's a way of 
So tying that to your code, but what they would do is they would, when you're dragging drop the widgets onto the GUI builder, in the background, what they were doing is they were creating a file that described what they're doing, right? Um, and often in the XML file, and then a runtime, what you did, you the application had to read that file in, and then, oh, you're describing a GUI, and you have a button here, so I have to create a button object, and then figure out, okay, that button object has this text, and it's in this location, and it's tied to that piece of code over there, so when you press the button, it triggers that function, right? And so that's an example of doing this, right? We have all this stuff, right? Um, and it's all in a file, and describing what just need to be done at run, how to put together things at runtime. And so, yeah, if you have an Android phone or an iOS phone, when you open application, there's a file there, that XML file, that's being read, and the application, the OS is, okay, here's how I have to put this together. From that description, I'm going to create the interface for you. What's really interesting now is both in iOS and Android, they're getting away from GUI building. They're building the systems where now you encode, you say, I want a button. But the GUI builders are an example of. Yeah. Yeah. Now what they do is the GUI builders actually write. They manage. There's a like other code that's ported on. And it's using regular C sharp for the builder buttons. And the right. Builders, but it's that that code you're not supposed to edit it. It's managed by the. Right. And but so it's pulling code out and putting code in, but it's not using a separate. Right. You're now. The movement is using your lang the current language to. When you want a button, you say new button, right? Or whatever the language says. And you, instead of having an XML file that describes a button and its location, um, you're doing it in the language you're developing in. Yeah. Or, or you drag and drop it in general. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. Just... But then, the, at least in the Android and the iOS world, they're not talking about a single source of truth, right? Um, the GUI builder is not the source of truth, it's the code it generates. That's that's what your interface is, right? The GUI builder has to read your code to right. get its state back so that it can go back to the GUI builder. Because the single source of truth is the code. There's no separate file right. telling the GUI builder how to get back to the GUI builder. Right. And I also will know that it's basically, um, you can drag and drop things, but um, you're free to modify that file, and they expect you to modify that file, and then they have to figure out how to re reconstruct it and the interface view for you. Has anyone used GraphQL besides I mean, one person I know? Does anyone know? How many people have ever heard of GraphQL? So is it, this is something you should know about. Um, so typically, right, when you got a server, you have some sort of API you can query. So I mean, Google has, right, I mean, all these services, and you can have an API to talk to the server. Um, but the problem is they, they say, here's a function, here's, you can, send a message to this particular web page of this particular URL and I give these parameters and you get this data back, right? Um, so they fix in advance what you can query. Oh, you want an artist and you get an artist and all everything about the artist, right? You have no choice. It's like they decide in advance what you can query and what you get back. Done, right? So it's like, okay, here's a list of 10 things or 100 things you can query and here's a format and we're done. GraphQL says, well, but that's crazy because um, you know, maybe you only want to know how old the artist is, right? 
And so why do you get all that information when you just want one piece of information? Or you want, you want, I want, I have a hundred artists, I just want to know who's the oldest, right? Um, or something, something like that. So what GraphQL allows you to do is you basically generate your own query um, given certain constraints and then the server then just returns what you asked for. You want you want all the artists, their name and their age, we're done, right? You can you can actually do that query. And so if you're involved in doing any sort of you know API work now, you really want to look into using GraphQL because it um, it makes the querying um, on the client side, far more flexible. Although I'm not sure if it, how more CPU intensive is on the server side. But it's the same thing. We need to be able to have a generic query that the server can then process and figure out what you want and respond to it. Um, it's not graphical. The problem is, um, remember, this is done across the network, right? So I'm going to, you know, so example is another um, class. Uh, the last assignment the students had was they had to build a client, um, attack the server, and um, I can't remember what the whole assignment is about. And once assignments, once I create the assignments, like I need to go to the next thing, right? Um, but I, but I specified, you know, here's how you can query things, right? So it's basically. You could post images and hashtags and comments, and you comment on. You know, so basically, sort of like a mini Twitter um, or Facebook type of situation. Um, but, but I specified, okay, here's the URL. If you want to get all the hashtags, here's the URL. You give this the hashtags, um, or here's a user. You can get all their posts. Um, so I specified all that in advance. And then some of the, well, what if I just want, right, recent posts? What if I just want um, my posts, right? What if I just want this or that? Well, I didn't think of that in advance. I said, okay, this, this look has functionality enough. And so I hard coded in what types of query you can make and what data you got back. Um, And it was all, fit, you know, you basically, when you design a server, you're trying to figure out what, what do the clients need, how can you get the information, and you hard code that up in, in the, the URLs you provide them and the parameters you let them select. GraphQL is like, well, no, you just hit, you get all this data, um, it's structured, here's the structure of the data, right? You give it, you give it basically a schema of the data, um, and then the users, the client can, once they know that schema, they can, you know, give me this piece, that piece, that piece, satisfying these, these constraints. Done. So it's the same thing of the XML schema, right? To once you got that schema, you can now um, make up your own query, right? Picking what pieces you want or don't want, rather than what people thought you might need in advance. But similar, where it's just
So again, this is another example of using, you know, schema about the data to be able to generate, um, not a GUI, but in this case, a query. Um, Yeah, so you want to be able, I mean, you know, normally when you create a class, right, that's a compile time construct. And so at compile time, we have fixed the structure and the functionality of objects, right? You're pretty much stuck. Um, and so, yeah, the active object model. Um, and sometimes you can think of it the same thing as schema, right? Except we're providing a schema they call metadata about the object, and then we can by changing the metadata, we change with the object, how it's structured, how it, how it can operate. And of course, life gets more complicated uh, because now things are more flexible. And when we have flexibility, I mean, it, there's a price for that. But it's um, but there are a lot of places where this happens, right? When you're developing a new system, it's continually morphed, right? So having having more flexible to change it on the fly is nice because well, do you want to have to recompile and change all these files? Just, no, I want to be able to mod trick it at runtime to see what the effect is and add these new features. So this, these patterns allow us to um, have more flexible software when needed. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, so they develop a toolkit, right, for that domain, right, and you reuse that in different, different games, yeah. But they go that route because they need they want that fast development time, right? The flexibility of changing um, the game you have to develop, right? And they all wouldn't be doing it if they didn't if they didn't think that was a more productive way of doing it, right? Yeah, what's the best way? Right. Yeah. Language. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're pushing, you're going from a general language to a 
Right, right. But I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone in the gaming industry thinks it's worth it, right? I mean. You know, sort of a, a brief look at some of the patterns people talk about, you know, have developed to make software more flexible, easier, you know. Um, easier to, well, more flexible in development. Um, couple other patterns. Um, So most languages, like my Java, right, there's values and there's objects, right? Values are numbers, um, strings, um, Boolean values. And you can't change them, right? You just, five is five, but you can't change five. Um, so there's, there's no state you can change. There's no side effects, right? Because if, I mean, you, we can't change five. Um, Actually, it turns out in small talk at one point you could change what five was. Um, and of course, as soon as you did that, the whole system crashed because the system was using, it wasn't like your one system was reusing the other system, you were actually modifying the current system. When we changed five, any place, any code that used number five was no different. Um, and so it was like, oh, it was fun, like, oh, change it to value, and all of a sudden, it was a crash, right? Um, and you hope you didn't save just the instant after you did that, because then when you build the program in, it was in the same state and would crash again. But there are objects, right? And there's there's side effects and there's pointers and all that stuff. Um, but so why do we limit ourselves to just these numbers of values, right? those types of values. Um, there are other places where we, we have values. Um, I mean, count numbers, money, I mean. You know, in the finance world, you can't, I mean, do you really want to modify the, the current value? I mean, it has to be a transaction, right, to show where the, Things came in and went out. Um, you know, we can use basic types, but you want to use a float for num for currency values. Um, no, because you, there's errors, right? So how do you re represent a dollar thirty-eight? Um, you don't want to use a float, so you want to use an integer. Um, so why not wrap it in a class, but you want, you want that class to be, I mean, actually have it immutable. Um, you know, so what do you do with the money, right? We could do this, right? The balance is five, but um, you know, so we get like a money class or currency class, but then there's all these side effects. Um, So we're going to sort of make our own values by making a, a class and making the class the immutable. Can't change it. So. 
Well, that's a that's a language issue, right? Um, so on Swift, they they pretty much um, elevated a struct from just the, the standard C little structure to something it can have has has of course properties or fields, um, but it can have methods. Um, and the you know all the fields are immutable by default, but you can modify it if you want. And then when you do an assignment, it's copied, right? You, you don't have pointers, right? So you pass it into the parameter, the function, it gets copied, and you pass it back, right? When you do assignments, it's, it's all copied like, like you would. It makes it immutable, so you don't have to worry about all these side effects. Uh, C-sharp has something similar. It does it. Yeah, it's, right. It's on the stack, so I mean, not. No, no. Um, right. So it's just useful because now we can um, have a, have a money object, whatever as you want, but it's immutable and it. We have operations on it. Um, so, I, yeah, so I create a new person, and person is a struct, and that and that just makes everything immutable. I can't ch change the value of x. Um, so this. There are times when it's useful to have something between a number or a string and a full-blown class with immutable fields. And the current trend in languages is to make more and more things immutable um, by default. Um, let's see, the model view controller, right? Everyone knows what the model view controller? Well, I'm old enough and weird enough that I actually used the original model view controller and I hated it. Um, And the, the problem was, um, in the original format, there was a lot of duplication. And the controller was not what people think today. The controller was, where does the input come from? And where does it go, right? So the controller, you had to program the controller to say, okay, the keystrokes go there, the keystrokes go there, you know, when I was control X, all that went to this function over here, but if you're typing the regular characters, it went to the text field, right? Um, and eventually, it was created in Smalltalk, and eventually they they hid all the controllers. It was like, well, it's pretty much automatic when you you know define a, a menu and you say, oh, here the, the shortcut is Control C. Um, why is the programmer then have to go over the controller and say, oh, look at the characters. Oh, it's, it's a control character and it's C, so that goes over there. Like, no, I mean, you, so in, in the menu you create your GUI, you had to specify, oh, Control here is a shortcut character. And then in your model, you say, okay, under, when you got control C, you do this. And then over here in the view, you say, okay, you know, it's a control character, what comes next? Oh, it's a C, it echoes over there. It's like, I did it three times. I mean, why do I have to do it three times? So I kind of just, eventually they did that. You just went to the menu item and said, that is you know, control C, and that calls this function over there. Um, and then they hid the controller in the menu object and um, but, but the whole, whole goal here was to separate out the interface from the model, right? And there are a lot of new variations on this, which um, don't necessarily have a controller in it, 
but the, the, the problem is the interface changes a lot when you're in development and all, all different types of changes, right? You, you want buttons and the colors and all that sort of stuff. And the model is, is, is a different type of beast and it changes at a different rate. And it's hard to test the interface, right? Because how do you test an interface? Well, there's various ways of doing that. You know, some tools like you simulate a button press at this location. That's not so great because then, you know, the designer comes and says, well, we know we want to move the button over here. And now you go back to your test and change all locations. You can give all your GUI widgets IDs, right? So what Apple does is when it tests interface on iOS, so like they give everything an ID. And then you can say, okay, turn on accessibility, allow me to access things by IDs. And now we can, we can do it. Um, but the goal here is to separate out the logic of of the model of the business that we're trying to do from the actual interface. Um, right? And so the goal is to divide into three pieces, right? There's the interface piece. There is the logic of the program piece, the model, and then the controller user input. Um, right, and so it's a model application, and often you've got observers in various pieces. So, you know, a GUI piece might be want to observe the you know, part of the model. So, when it changes, it's updated on the screen. Um, And the view is just, it's just a display, right? What, what the person actually sees on the screen. Um, and each view has a controller, so no so the input comes from. Um, and this is what the original controller did in the MVC pattern, is it just handled keystrokes, mouse clicks, mouse movements. And directed, you know, what do we do when the mop, right? Now, a lot of GUI frameworks now this is handled for you, right? You have a button, you don't have to tell the button what to do, and we just tell the button when you're pressed, right? Then call this function, right? Or do this thing. Um, and you don't have to write code and say, oh, the mouse was pressed on the button. Now it's just automatic, right? You just say, on mouse down, on the button, do this. And so we're not dealing directly with the mouse location and the mouse up or down. It's done for us. The controller is still there, but it's doing the work behind the scenes. Um, Right, and so the structure is, you know, it's basically, um, you know, there's a model, and with updates, it will tell the view or other pieces of the program it updated. Yeah. And so, yeah, the small talk has a bunch of views and controllers. Um, so the first thing you know it is, this is what people call an architectural pattern. So it's telling you how to structure your program, All right? The, the gang of four patterns doesn't talk about how to put an application together, All right? With um, model view controller, our side too is it's an architecture pattern. You should Right. So I'm surprised that like, in the small talk that you just showed, that right. also in Java, it's like the button has the model controller. The, the text yeah, has right. a model right. view. And, and I don't get that because it just it seems like it's a, it's a macro pattern applied at the, the micro level. Right. Um, 
So the views are just widgets, right? It's not the whole view, it's just parts of the view. Um, and then each view has its own controller. When in, in Java, then there's a yeah. model, which like for a button is just as a presser. Right, right. That just seems like Right. And that's really application stuff. Like I said, they they're taking the pattern and so that's this part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that they've it's done for you, it's okay, right? But initially, like no, you there was a you know a you know check button view, and then you quit, you wrote the controller to modify and it's like. Why am I doing that? Um, and yeah, I mean, people on the iOS world are coming up with all these variants. Um, and someday I'll put out this year, go through a bunch of them, but it's hard to give examples because then you have to translate to simple no and um, GUI environments are tricky because different. Each one has slightly different. So I'll just let you know that. Yeah, it's basically you got a bus, right? And when an event happens, that you put them in the bus, and then someone else can. Yeah, so they're always trying to figure out good ways of putting together applications. It's like. I think we're still trying to figure out a good way of building GUI applications. Um, but the fun part becomes now um, the web world is huge, right? I mean, so how do we, I mean, in the web, we are producing a, a GUI, right? But it's a lot more complicated because there's this network that goes back to the right. Um, and so there's a lot of different patterns that have risen in the web world to actually make life a little bit easier to build applications. Um, so the template view. Uh, <clears throat> I can still remember um, when this first came out, and one of the authors was saying, "That's the way you build web pages." Like uh, it was back then, but not anymore. Um, but this is PHP, right? It's just you embed in HTML special tags, which are embedded code, and then the PHP engine. Actually, we'll render that at runtime, right? And the problem is, so when you, when you want to build a simple web page, it's, it's pretty easy to use, right? But when I think it's more and more complicated, um, it gets hard because now all your code is embedded inside of HTML. And how do you test it? How do you, when there are bugs, how do you find where the problems are? Um, can you imagine building Gmail and PHP? I mean, it's just all those things you're doing, it's just not going to work, right? It's, Um,
So it's easy, right? I mean, there are tools which allow you to sort of lay the page out graphically. So graphic designers can do that, and you go in and you then add the code to the logic. Um, but it's, I mean, you're mixing HTML and, and code together in one file, and it's just Not a good mixture, right? I mean, it, for simple things, yes, but as it's more and more complicated, um, it gets harder to maintain a good structure. I mean, how do you do if statements, right? How do you iterate over a collection, right, to get a list or drop down menu? Um, how do you keep a lot of lo the logic separate from the GUI? Well, but the HTML is a GUI part, right? So your logic is embedded inside of it. Um, so we'll go on. Does anyone use servlets in the Java world? So with, with PHP, the idea was we embed our code inside HTML, right? But servlets, the idea is, no, 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 we're gonna write code which will generate the HTML, right? So sort of two separate, different way of approaches, right? One is HTML is the thing and your code is, is inside. The other one is, no, no, is our code, your code is gonna generate the HTML. Um, now doing it this way is a nightmare, right? I mean, at this little level where you're you're sit, saying, you know, HTML body, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the problem is, as things are more and more complicated, um, a lot of websites do generate the web pages, right, in, from code. Even more interesting is, right, these days, right, the, the GUI is generated on the client side in JavaScript, right? So the server is sending JavaScript to the client, which will then will generate on the fly um, the interface, the web page you see. Um, so different languages have different ways of doing this, right? Um, you know, the closure example where you just, all right, train a function which um, this is generating a login section of a page for, um, the website. So now um, we're in the world not of embedding code inside of web pages, but we're going to generate the web pages in our code. But we, we want frameworks to help us do this. Um, So w one pattern, um, which I really haven't seen used is what you call a page controller. And, you know, basically you send the request to a particular object. Now they're gonna extract all the information out of the request and then generate the page for you. Um,
and each URL or has a different page controller. Another one is a front controller where there's like one controller that gets all requests and it it does a lot of common work like okay I get a request and then the request comes in it's either a get usually a get or a post right and if the get there are parameters you have to pull out and you look at if it's a post you got the body contains information about the request that you're either sending or receiving um and you may need all you need security checks right because now there's this since your page probably has javascript in it you've got this cross-site scripting problems you can have um you've got cookies and all sort of stuff you want to extract the cookies and see what information the client sent back to you so you know what's going on um And so basically this one, you know, one piece of code handles all his requests, right? Parses the URL for you, figure out the parameters, figures out, um, you know, which, which function to call to actually handle the request once it's done everything. So all the pages go to the same? Right. Instant. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Well, so it gets complicated because now what happens when you want to scale up, right? So one thing you do is you have um, you know, multiple instances of your web server that, you know, the request comes in and then you you figure out load balance and somehow you send requests to different, right? And the request is handled by a different machine, right? But the systems I use now, right? I mean, you basically, um, there's a pipeline and at the very end of the pipeline, you say, oh, in your call, you say, here's a URL and here's a function to call. Here's a URL, here's a function to call. And the front controller gets all requests from that URL and URLs. And then it says, okay, it does all the work of parsing the URL. So when it gets to the function, it says, here's, here's your parameters, right? Here's all, you want the headers, here are the headers. It parses all that for you. Um, it does some security checks to make sure those are all done for you. And you could also have to go to source for each page and that those can all derive. Yeah, but the frameworks I've used all do it in one spot. So you can create, you then set up the pipeline in one spot. Um, and then your code is at the end of that pipeline. Yeah. No, I, I just, all I do is I, um, when I add a new page, I add another function and, and just say, this URL maps this function. And that gets sent to the, front controller in a source file no 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 it just it's basically you tell it it's just data right i mean it's basically a url call this function url call this function yeah. yeah right And so it's just it's more complicated because you have to worry about the pipeline. But um, like I said, I haven't seen that view one, two, three, 
It'd be like four different web frameworks, and now you're the same. So they reload the page every time. Because that's that's one of the things that I find challenging. The application that I have right now. Um, every time you get that way, the server is always hmm. changing. So every time you make a request, but when I see now, most Yeah, usually it's like more JavaScript. Yeah, so this is, um, here we're talking about the server side, right? But uh, now what's happening is, yeah, you, you have what they call um, single page applications, right? Where JavaScript on the client side is actually after generating pages. And then you have the same problem on the JavaScript, because now the JavaScript is ha has needs to be able to handle different URLs, right? Um, and on the client side, um, so then you you get routing there too. Um, and then you avoid that round trip, right? But then does the JavaScript have the ability to, because I used to be able to do this with frames, and then it becomes, it becomes but if, if your JavaScript needs data, it's hard to then go to the server and just say, I just Data. Well, that's um, that was solved. Well, the first solution was AJAX. So you, you should make a basically a request to the server and you seek the data back. What? Huh? Well, that's the original solution, and that caused all kinds of problems because you it's, it's again, it's just an HTTP request. Um, but, and so the open and then it calls the connection, but you may want the connection to stay open. And so there's long polling and all kinds of weird things people do. But the modern solution is called, you know, it's um, web sockets. Just one of some of the problems with Ajax, but Ajax is pretty, I mean, a common solution. Um, and so this is, you know, example from yeah, this is an example from the web page I wrote for new graduate students to register for classes. Um, and you just have a, you know, it's basically, you know, you registering with the Gitter post and the URL, and then um, you're specifying you know, what parameter should be there in case they don't show up. It throws an exception so you can catch and deal with it. And then there's a, a function you call that actually responds to the request. And so this is basically a mapping, right? Here's it's a post at this URL, and here's a function you call. You pass, you know, here are the parameters for that function. And then it does all the work of, you know, figuring out what the answer is and then responding back with some sort of web page somehow, right? Like I said, most, I mean, I think Django worked this way, Ruby and Rails worked this way, right? I mean, The JSP which we write, JSP. Right. Uh, that comes under uh, template, uh, pattern or not? Um, the JSP, um, JavaScript pages? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that's the standard, that's fine, right? Like, yeah. Okay. I thought the example which you showed is oh, yeah. not to follow, like the template should be but it, it, it's used, it has limitations, right? How do you, I mean, can you imagine building, um, like I said, Gmail using 
Yeah. We we should not embed the code, but we can have a placeholder for the values. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. But codes need to be say uh, tested only. Like either I have a code or the placeholder. Both things gonna say it. Yeah, but it's. You have to keep in mind, so the, the, temp, the template is good for simple pages, right? Yeah. It's very direct, very easy. And PHP is very popular, right? Um, because it's very easy to use. Um, and for small, for reasonable sized pages, it's quick development and it's fast, right? Yeah. Yeah. The values is being fetched from the model. So should we say that as a template? Is that better? No, but you're still you're still embedding in your not the code. We are not embedding code. We are just saying a placeholder with the actual value for us to come. Yeah, still using a template, right? Because you that yeah. the HTML page with that with those you know those variable signs, right? It's still a template. Yeah. Which is a good thing. I yeah, think. yeah. Because seeing the PPT, I thought template should not we should not use template uh, data. It's nothing like that. No, it's just we can use it. I mean, we are using it actually. Yeah.